Speaking Christian, by which I mean knowing and understanding Christian language, is in a state of crisis in our culture. For many people, Christianity has become an unfamiliar language. Many people either do not know the words at all, or if they have heard the words, have no idea what they mean, or perhaps likely do not care what they mean. Then there is another crisis uh, across recent decades. The words that Christians have used can take on very different meanings or different emphases. This only creates more confusion and misunderstanding. Here's an example of the crisis and confusion I'm talking about. Do you know the word apocalypse or apocalyptic? The words apocalypse and apocalyptic have to do with the end of the world. But some people have taken that word and that literature and run so far as to make the end of the world a central part of the Christian faith. Christian faith, for them at least, means mostly looking for and waiting for the end of the world and determining what happens to whom. That was never the intent of apocalyptic literature in the Bible. No, apocalyptic literature is a type of biblical literature that emphasizes the lifting of the veil between heaven and earth and the revelation of God and God's plan for the world. And there is a helpful and positive point to the literature, and it is not to make us fearful and attentive to the end of the world or who is, to quote, left behind. Our passage for today is considered apocalyptic liter literature. In fact, with the same essential passage in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, Mark 13 is considered by scholars to be called the little apocalypse, a short version of warnings about the end of the world. The longer version, of course, comes in the book of Revelation. Jesus is not just teaching people about love and forgiveness here. He is lifting the veil between heaven and earth, and talking about God's ultimate intentions and the end of the world. And that is why this passage is called the little apocalypse. Jesus is not just telling stories and saying, let the little children come to me. He is speaking about the things that really haunt human life, wars and violence, natural disasters and famines, and how God will triumph finally over those worst things. But this is but the beginning of the birth pains. Birth pangs mean something being brought to birth, and it hurts. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs, which means that in the eternal fruitfulness of God's plan, the bad stuff, wars and rumors of wars, violence and hatred, earthquakes and other natural disasters, are giving way to the goodness of God. This is part of the gospel, the good promises, the good news of God. So I want to say three things about apocalyptic literature and this passage and birth pains with the hope of helping all of us with our Christian faith and our life as God's people. First, these words of Jesus about birth pains want to remind us that bad things are a part of life. The setting of this passage is very commonplace. The disciples are walking casually out of the massive, magnificent temple in Jerusalem. They gaze at the beauty and magnitude of the place. What large stones and large buildings. And Jesus bursts their grandiose ideas. Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. That temple out of which Jesus and his disciples would have been walking was called the second temple. This temple was the largest of all the temples ever built on that spot. Bigger and more elaborate than the one built by Solomon which was destroyed by the Babylonians 500 years before Jesus' time. The second temple was built after the return from the exile, and then that temple was greatly enhanced by King Herod in the decades before Jesus' ministry, so it was very magnificent. But in the years after Jesus' life in ministry in 70 AD, that second massive and beautiful temple was destroyed by the Romans, who conquered and assumed power in the entire region of the Mediterranean. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when Mark was writing his gospel and depicting Jesus walking out of the temple with his disciples, that extravagant temple had already been destroyed. So this text wants very much to remind us that bad things are very much a part of life. If the beautiful temple of God can be destroyed, we can keep worshiping and serving God? 
If the violence keeps happening, if wars keep raging, if famines and pandemics continue, can we trust God? We know all too well about these questions, and Jesus helps us with apocalyptic images. Jesus says, indeed, bad things will come, and don't we know it? Leaders will try to lead you astray, violence will be part of life, even mass shootings, fires will rage, and people will die. It is scary. It is heartbreaking. Yet Jesus says this is just the beginnings of the birth pangs. Something is being brought to birth, and it hurts. As long as there is life, there is heartache. As long as there is the world, there are earthquakes and fires. As long as there are people and power structures, there will be bad leaders. As long as there are boundaries and borders, there will be wars and famines. As long as we dwell in these bodies, there will be cancer and other problems that threaten us. This is all part of the wonderful, mysterious, magnificent, complicated world we live in. Bad things are a part of life. Be patient, Jesus says. Be aware. Be awake. Second, this kind of apocalyptic literature about the end of the world and raising the veil between heaven and earth and the warnings about the end times want to confirm for us that God is still in charge. With so many dying of COVID-19 these past 19 months, with so many mass shootings, with so much fear and heartache among so many of God's people who are seeking asylum, and with so much growing animosity all around us. It can feel hopeless. Disillusionment can be overwhelming. When Mark wrote his gospel, the people knew that the temple had been crushed by the Romans. And we hear these words, and we know all too well about the difficulties that we face in our own lives. Illness gaining on us, anxiety haunting us, failures and regrets that we cannot get away from, and depression, anxiety, and more always lurking. And we hear these words. We can even recall the Twin Towers toppling on 9-11 in New York City, or the plume of smoke billowing from the Pentagon. We can easily sense the fears about gun violence in our society. We can name injustices in our city, inequities in our schools, racial problems that perplex us. Could God really still be in charge? Jesus says, this is but the beginnings of the birth pains. Here's another way to think about it. Jesus appears, Jesus appears on the scene and announces that the kingdom of God has come. The kingdom or reign of God comes in his person, his message, his presence. He is God in the flesh, in our midst. The kingdom of God has arrived. He will teach and preach and embody the fullness of God, love, kindness, forgiveness, peace, patience, light, joy, justice, hope. But there is an already but not yet about this reign of God. It is already present in him, in what Jesus says and does, in love prevailing over hate, service over selfishness, generosity over greed, life over death, all the things that the kingdom of God is already present already visible, already distinctive, already wonderful in him. We see it. We glimpse it for our own lives. We taste and know that it is good and what God promises for all. But there is also a not yet. This kingdom, this reign of God is not yet fully arrived. There are wars and rumors of wars. There are earthquakes and fires. There are troubles in our hearts, cancers in our bodies, crises in our communities, pandemics and disappointments about so many things. The reign of God is not yet fully arrived. And Jesus says, this is but the beginnings of the birth pangs. Salvation is a process. We are getting there by God's grace, but we are not there yet. The kingdom of God has come, but it has not yet fully come to fruition. So do not lose heart. We do not lose focus. We do not give in. We keep looking to God because God will have the last word. God will complete all things just as God created all things. As the psalmist said, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Lift up your heads, be lifted up. Third, this apocalyptic piece, these words of Jesus want to motivate us because we have work to do to promote the full reign of God, the full coming of heaven on earth, as I always like to say, our job is to make earth a little bit more like heaven each and every day. 
As I alluded, one of the real dangers of apocalyptic literature is how easily we get distracted. We get so busy discerning the times, we get so confident about the signs and what they mean, and we fall away from the mission that is ours, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. We get so focused on the apocalypse that we fall away from discipleship. Jesus says, follow me. Jesus says, beware, but mostly, Love God and love your neighbor. Jesus exhorts us to keep going, to trust, and to serve God. This week I started reading Anne Lamont's book entitled Almost Everything, Notes on Hope. And here is what she says. Of course we are reduced at times, late at night, no matter how deep our faith in God or goodness or one another to quivering aspic. No matter how beautiful our views are of the trees and birds and children, There are such scary pronouncements from Washington or our doctors that we can't help bearing the descending tones of age, global warming, the ticking of the nuclear clock, the heartbeats of 7.6 billion other people around us. This stuff is scary and it's very real. Yet hope is real too. And this is also true. Life is way wilder than I am comfortable with, way farther out as we used to say, more magnificent, more deserving of all and I would add more benevolent, well-meaning, kindly. Waves and particles, redwoods, poetry, this world of wonders and suffering, great crowds of helpers and humanitarians. Here we are alive right now, together. I worry myself sick about the melting ice caps, the escalating arms race, and the polluted air as I look forward with hope to the cleansing rains, the coming spring, the warmth of summer, the student marches. John Lennon said everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. John Lennon was a better theologian than he even knew. We have all we need to come through. Against all odds, no matter what we have lost, no matter what messes we've made over time, no matter how dark the night, we are offered kindness, soul, light, and food which create breadth and spaciousness, which create hope sufficient for the day. Friends, we may keep offering kindness and soul and light. May we walk with God and seek to serve God, trusting in God's kingdom. May we keep moving with hope towards the new birth that God promises for us and for all God's people everywhere. We have so much work to do with God, for God, for God's promised reign. May we not ever be distracted, but seek always to be faithful in loving in serving and spreading light and life and following Jesus. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, the invitation is this. Remember that we have read the end of the book and we know who wins in the end. God wins. Remember that bad things are a part of life. And yet Jesus says this is just the beginning of the birth pangs. Be patient, Jesus says. Be aware. Be awake, but remember, remember that God is still in control. And God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. And so, friends, we have work to do, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God, to love God and love neighbor. And as we work to bring about this already but not yet kingdom, know that if you are looking for a place to be reminded of God's goodness, to be reminded that you are not alone when bad things happen. Know that you are welcome here. All, all are welcome here. It doesn't matter about your past, what you have done or left undone. It doesn't matter who you love or who you vote for. God loves you, and you are welcome here. If you have a question of faith or a prayer request, or would like to know more about joining this church, please send me an email or give me a call or see me after the service. I would love to talk with you, pray for you and yours, and hear your story. And now let us continue to worship the God who is making all things new as we sing our hymn of response. 